Ladies, gentle people, sentient rat folk, and anyone and everyone in between, today I've got a whopper of a treat for you. That's right, it's our review of Gloom. Having a good time, having a good time. The transcendently bitty tactical co-op dungeon crawler with secret unlockable characters, a persistent world, random events, and over 70 campaign missions, each of which can take actual hours. And who better to understand gloom than a man perpetually trapped in England? I want to be happy, but it's hard. This game has had the community in a tizzy for years after a couple of increasingly successful Kickstarters, and uh, at this point we're on familiar dangerous territory, because you see, Shut Up and Sit Down traditionally doesn't gel that well with the propositions of Kickstarter and what people love about them. These are often games that have huge boxes filled with stuff, miniature models, add-ons, and this isn't to yuck the yum of people who love that stuff. If you love it, brilliant, you do you. It's just, as damaged veterans of the video game landscape, we're perhaps a little bit more cautious about hyped work from less experienced designers. So when Gloomhaven crept into our peripheral vision as merely the second self-published games from Cephalofair Games' as Isaac Childress, and when it came in a box that was heavy enough to arouse a sentient trebuchet, well, we approached it with trepidation. But listen, let's not beat around the bush, let's evade that classic mid-review turnaround. Gloomhaven is great. Whew, right? Let's do this. So listen, it's a cold day, I'm wearing a t-shirt for continuity reasons, and I wish I wasn't. And this is gonna be a very long review, so strap yourself in and please make sure that your mind belt is securely fastened. First of all, you and your dungeon colleagues must choose from one of six starting characters, represented simply by symbols and names. Do you wanna be a brute? Do you wanna be a scoundrel? What does that mean? Well, I don't know. You'll have to just open up one of these little boxes and see. So I'm like, mind thief, mind thief. That sounds like me, I'll be a mind thief. I open up the box and it's a little rat. I'm a little rat now, I do rat things. It's my life. And boof, there's your very first dash of Gloomhaven magic because to directly quote Brad Pitt from the film Seven, I like boxes and finding out what it is that is inside of them. But, and this is the crucial crux of Gloomhaven, it isn't a game about unlocking secrets. Without them, it's still a really good game. Games with legacy style elements frequently struggle with this, using the serotonin hit of opening tiny boxes as the core of the pie, rather than just the details on the pastry. Where, of course, obviously what you really want is a pie that looks something like this. Beautiful craft work on the outer shell, but inside, the beefy sustenance of 100% eggs. This beautiful dish will serve a full family of good friends. They make sure, of course, that the eggs are well cooked. Yeah, that's perfect. Gloomhaven is a strange thing. It's feature rich and rules complete from the first quest, but it does introduce new things and things do change ever so slightly. It's huge. I don't really think the game expects most people to ever finish it, but that's fine. And also, once you've completed a mission once, you'll never play it again. It isn't a role-playing game, but contained within this box, you're basically looking at a sprawling role-playing world. So it isn't really a legacy game, it's the sort of thing you play for a few months, put it away, and then get it out again in a year or two. Maybe with different characters, maybe with an entirely different set of players, but you'll be jumping straight in to stuff that's fresh. You never do anything twice. And obviously there are ways within the game to reset it completely so you could start again, but I just don't realistically see why many players would ever even consider it. So it's less about commitment and consequence and more about just constantly having something new to do. You've got this, look at this huge book of missions. And this is silly, this is really silly. You've got this actual cardboard fold out world map. And when you unlock new missions, you put stickers on. And when you do the missions, you cross them off with a Sharpie. This doesn't need to be in the box. It's silly. It's got video game style mechanics like unlockable achievement stickers. It's exactly the sort of thing that might have you going, oh, and being excited. But me, I'm an old, cold video games veteran and it just makes me feel a bit dead inside. But this doesn't. I'm smiling. I'm grinning. What's going on? Gloomhaven is not what it appears to be. It's kind of like a cardboard mirage or 
A siren that crashes your ship into unexpectedly lovely rocks. It's huge, but it's also surprisingly focused. It's got multiple fistfuls of cardboard that actually convey quite a lot of character. This is a big box, but it contains more ideas than it does bits of plastic. And if you're a designer, if you're a designer, you've got to look at this. This manual is fantastic. It may be the best we've seen in years. It's thicker than a decent pancake, yes, but it's clean, it's well organized. And this visual reference on the back where you just have pictures of all the symbols or all of the card backs and the page numbers for it, do this. Crucially, it's a manual that you don't even have to check that often. A real contrast to Imperial Assault, which I love, but I frequently found spluttered to a halt just because it had so many little specific rules. But Gloomhaven is a game of quite complex possibilities, but in the practice of playing it, it's very simple. For all of its bits and pieces, I'd almost say it's elegant. <laughs> Hey Matthew, how's it going? I just hey. need to talk to you for five minutes in the other room. Yeah, I'm just familiar with you at the moment. Yeah, sorry. Just come with me, please. Is, is, sure. Hi. Just thought I'd drop in and check that you know what the word elegant means. You know, because if you were to look at something like this, quite big, you know, whereas usually when we use the word elegant, we mean that uh, a game packs a lot of fun into not many rules, or for example, into not many components, I'm just a little concerned with the direction that you're going here. I'm just gonna have a word with my superiors for just one minute. Hi, is that Mr. Big P? He thinks what is elegant? It's literally a box full of tiny bits. Did you show him the chart? Yeah, I'm showing him right now, yeah. Yeah, I know the CEO isn't gonna be happy. Tell him he has 24 hours. 24 hours to prove this game is elegant. Did you tell him? No, I was gonna after the All call. Right. All right, okay. okay. All right, you hang up. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. I love you. No, I love you. Okay, bye. Okay. Bye. Okay, bye. 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 What a nice evening. Elegance. Right. What's the opposite of fluff? I'll tell you, it's crunch. And this is as crunchy as you like. It is a veritable fistful of cornflakes for your mind. Crunch it. all of this stuff. It's just flavor. The game resides here in this hand of cards. These cards are your character. Each round you choose two of these cards and activate them in either order, using the bottom power of one card and the top of the other. After that, both the cards go into your discard pile, providing it wasn't of really good power with this symbol in the corner, in which case the card is lost. So you keep playing pairs of cards until you run out of cards, and then you take your discard pile and you get it back, but you lose one of those cards. If you think you can afford to sit out for an entire round, you can choose the card that you lose and get a couple of health back. What a treat. But if you don't have time for that, and you often don't, you have a short rest, which means you lose one of those cards at random. Oh, not that one. Honestly, this system is wonderful just because of how much it does. First of all, delicious fatigue. By the end of the mission, you haven't really got many options, but the beginning of a mission is just pure joy. You're an explosion of opportunity. You all just rock into a dungeon and just go, Wah, we're here. Secondly, it sticks a brazier underneath your bottom, keeping you on the move. You see, when you run out of health in this game, ah, uh, you need to go home. You're out of the mission, but, Great thing is, at any point, if a big lot of damage happens, six damage, six, then you can avoid it by just saying, nope, not happening, instead I'm going to lose a card. Which is fine, until you can't play any cards, in which case you also need to go home. So really, your hand of cards are a self-embedded timer for the mission, but one that you can manipulate and play with at your own risk. And as you might expect, each character has a deck of cards that is entirely different. And half of the fun of this game 
It's just working out why. And the cool thing about this is you learn as you play via experimentation. You discover your own cool little combos. The scoundrel, for example, is really good at fighting stuff when it's on their own. And so as a mind rat, I can be like, mind control, mind control skeleton, you go away. And then this guy's on his own and we can be like, hey, give me your milk money. He'd be like, I don't have any milk money. I bring my own milk to school. But because this is a timer just for your character, it means there's always an element of listening to your team and working together and trying to work out what your current momentum is. As you play through missions, your perspective is gonna shift. Sometimes you're gonna wanna recycle your deck very carefully. At other points, you'd be like, screw it and explode like a mayfly of force. This need to constantly negotiate with your team about your current momentum is where a lot of the fun of Gloomhaven comes from, more specifically when players don't see eye to eye. Purple energy! Barbarian Night Lord, I need your sword! Yeah, it's fine. I'm just gonna finish this chapter and then uh, I'll go to the shops. Get you one. After I open this, uh, I've got to just probably go open this treasure chest. I should tell you what, you put the kettle on. And yes, it is a game where you work together to do the missions and kill the things, and yes, but there's also going to be times when you don't because of treasure and experience points. And look, there are going to be turns where you might, you know, run over here and then leap halfway across the map to a treasure chest because there's a, I quite like treasure. Or there might be turns where you look at your cards and you put them down and people go, what are you doing? And you go, well, actually, I thought I'd just like hoover up all of these coins on the floor because the thing, uh, I couldn't really do it. I, I, like, I like money. And at the start of each mission, you also get a secret objective card. And so you might slightly behave in a way that isn't always 100% helpful. And the final kicker here is XP, experience points. The universal juice of leveling up and getting nice and bigger well, you get that mostly from playing cards that give you XP. And the cards that do really cool things, but then you lose immediately, they often give you more XP. And you start to see how this all webs together into a kind of constellation of fun. The way you play your hand of cards is a process that you're always looking to optimize, but optimization is always a fluid concept and sometimes results in a mild bit of conflict. Chances are, at any point when you're playing, you'll be leaning slightly more towards being either altruistic or greedy. And you know what? That's fine. In fact, that's fun. Gloomhaven is a cooperative game, and an essential part of that is giving players the space to not cooperate. If you don't have that option, then you're not really cooperating. You're contractually obliged. And if you find yourself contractually obliged to be in a dungeon, then either you're playing a game that isn't that good, or you've made a series of unusual life choices. Because look, you're going to have moments where you're a bit cheeky, and everyone's going to look at you and go, really? And then in a few turns after that, someone else will be a bit cheeky and pick up all the coins instead of attacking a thing, and everyone else will go, yeah? Really? But what's wonderful about this is then you'll get to the end of the mission and things will be tight and things will be tough and you'll all play 100% focused as a team and you'll come together and you'll scrape through. And not only is that sense of texture fun, it's a system that actually actively adds to the game's balancing. Every mission ends up feeling like you just made it or you just didn't. Because honestly, you're a bunch of chances just greedily skirting around the edge of disaster. And this mild conflict you have around the table gives you space to develop a sense of character. Gloomhaven does have a story, but it's the faint fiction that you whip up yourselves that actually adds weight to the world. For example, you draw city cards when you go back to town and road cards when you're on your way to a mission. Both of these create mini scenarios that you have to deal with as a party and ask you to choose from one or two options and the outcome is usually bad. Now these random event decks can have a cool arc to them and the fact that sometimes you make a choice that gets another card added to the deck so you have a continuing storyline. But really the main function of these decks, as far as I'm concerned, is just they ask you questions about who your party is. Who, do you, who are you guys? What sort of people are you? You're the sort of people who kill a bear for no reason? Are you? So for example, we kept pulling out cards that involved situations where Vermling were being bullied by the man. Did we want to step in and look after the rat people? Yes, because I am a rat. I'm a rat person. So as a party, we were unified, always. We're not standing for this. 
But the thing is, had I not been a rat? Before I opened that little box and revealed the fact that I was a rat, I didn't even know that you could be a rat. And if I didn't know that, would I have stood up for the rat people? Oh, I don't know, probably not. In case you didn't know, humans are quite bad. And hey, you know what? This stuff is pretty cool. It doesn't grab you by your ears and narrative at you. It doesn't make you read reams of stuff. It just makes you feel like you're a part of this world, mainly by asking you what you think of it. What do you want to do? Here's a situation. What's going on? Because, oh yeah, you could also be loved or hated by the city of Gloomhaven, which in turn then affects the outcome of the choices on this. There's a lot going on. If this is starting to sound to you a lot like a video game, then you're dead right. It even has the same weird sensibilities of heroes acting in quite strange ways just to get the most experience and gold, or having missions where you think, you know what, there's no way we're going to do this. So let's just quickly run past all the enemies, get the treasure behind the boss, leave the temple, and then just never come back here ever again, because we got the thing. And just like a game like Bethesda's Skyrim, whilst it ostensibly has years of stuff, you could probably just do 30% of Gloomhaven and be satisfied. Because honestly, it has exactly the same relationship with quantity. The point here isn't to try and do it all. It's that the path you carve through this game will feel personal to you. Maybe you'll stop playing before you fight forest pixie things, and I'll never get into a fight with a dragon. At the start of the game, each character gets a character quest card. And when you finish that quest, the character retires and you unlock a new one. But it's entirely random, which means I could be at the very end of the campaign and just be discovering stuff that you found right at the start. And the thing is, personally, I've done maybe 10% of this game at, at most. And here's the thing, for the first seven hours of playing or something, we didn't even level up or get any new items. I've now had 20 hours of playing this game just as a rat man, and I love it. I want to be a rat man right now, but I have to work. Let me be a rat man. Listen, right? I don't know what this stuff is. I don't know what any of it is. There's a bunch of stuff. There's envelopes. There's a town records, but I don't know what this stuff is. And you might expect a professional like me to have opened up all of these boxes, all of these envelopes, before I started reviewing the game. But do you know what? No. If I wasn't enjoying this experience, then yes, I would dissect it like a frog. But this is a game that I want to play. Because here's the thing, a review isn't an exhaustive list of things. A good review should be a window to a view of how something might make you feel. And the fact that I blankly refuse to spoil this experience for myself because I care about it, well, that should tell you something. So let me tell you how Gloomhaven makes me feel. And I think this is why I love Gloomhaven. It does remind me of video games, but not modern video games. Modern video games, in general, have become a little bit too manipulative. Too much take, not enough give. No, no, no. Gloomhaven reminds me of 2001 and a PlayStation 2 game called Baldur's Gate Dark Alliance. It was a hack and slash game of dungeons and dungeons and progress and dungeons. And me and a friend, we rented it out, right? And we played it till six in the morning. And then we got up first thing in the morning and we played it again and we finished it. It was simple, it was repetitive, but it was just constantly pleasing. And there's this simple nostalgic kind of warmth. Gloomhaven feels like the idea of Hero Quest, minus the disappointed realization that there's actually not a lot to Hero Quest. It's to puff from the cardboard furniture, which is weirdly more exciting than the game. That's Gloomhaven. It's not a game where you sit down and look at this box full of things and go, oh, I can't wait to open that, I can't wait to open that. No, you just sit down with great company knowing that you're gonna be doing the same thing over and over again for a really long time and that that thing you're gonna be doing is just gonna be warm and satisfying. And what does that come down to? Well, that, it comes down to crunch. Let's get crunchy, baby! Crunchy. Why do I keep doing this? I'll tell you what's crunchy, son. Combat decks. Every time you try and hit an enemy, you draw a card. It could be a plus one, a minus one, a zero. There's a bunch of things. It could be double damage. It could be a miss. You even have items like armor, which can make you add extra minus one cards, extra cards into your deck, because your deck 
is yours. As you level up, you can remove cards that are bad, add in cards that are better, and it even has class-specific combo upgrades so you can go pow, 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 and multiple things can happen. It's cool. Also, as you level up, your basic deck of cards, you get access to more, better cards, but even from the very beginning of the game, in addition to having your standard vanilla use these cards set, you have optional stuff that you can swap in and out. So if you're feeling clever, you can modify your deck to make it even more effective. I was feeling very clever and I changed my deck and made it much worse. You'll even unlock the ability to improve your cards, adding stickers to little tiny nodes. Here's some footage of me pretending to do that because no, I'm not allowed. My character doesn't have enough gold. And it's not just characters, the city levels up, meaning that when you start new characters, they start at a base higher level, you get access to better equipment in the shop. As you play and as you unlock new characters and as you keep doing stuff, you're never starting again. You're always just being dropped slightly, slightly further into an exponentially deeper pool. Next up, let's talk about enemies. And yes, the lighting has changed and I've changed my clothes because this review is so long that it's taking me actual days to film. And on that note, you've been watching for a while and there hasn't been anything stupid involving green screen. So I guess let's, there are skeletons in this game. <gasps> Right, you've had your stupid stuff, now we've got a lot to get through, so let's let's crack on. These are the different enemy cards that you get in the game. And there's a lot of them. Each of these cards contains eight different difficulty levels of enemy to fight, and there's a lot of information on these. But, and this is really, really neat, what you do is you slide them into these little cardboard envelopes, which, A, allow you to have all this information in the game, but most of it at any one point is hidden away from the player, so you can just focus on what you need to know right now. And B, these things double up as things you put on the table and then have different numbers for different enemies so you can keep track of health and statuses and stuff. Isn't that neat? Isn't that a cool, elegant little system? But better than that, oh boy, better are the enemy decks. Now, there isn't one of these for every specific enemy in the game, but they're all for different types. So we've got an Inox Guard here. We'll just use the Guard deck. And what's lovely about these little decks is they actually give all of the enemies you fight, in combination with the specific stats and rules on each of these cards, a fantastically clear sense of flavour. And so it means what do guards do? Well, they move around slowly and they might put up their shields. What do archers do? Well, they'll run away and fire bows at you and they may even drop a trap and leap backwards. We had these shambolic zombie style creatures that were incredibly slow but hit like a truck. And if they move at you very quickly at any point, then doing so actually damages them. And just by having these very specific set of things that can occur for these characters on these tiny decks, it suddenly brings this game to life. There's even specifically a deck that's just a boss deck. And it means that every single boss fight in the game will have specific actions, just very simple ideas that add uniqueness to what is otherwise a very long, repetitive thing. But let's be real here, it isn't all sunshine and pureed roses. Stuff like guards and archers and dogs and zombies, yes, these are all quite thematic and they pop off the board, but when you're fighting against sun demons and flame demons, uh, it's impossible not to feel like a middle-aged man having somebody explain to you the difference between Justin Bieber and Harry Styles. You appreciate that some people might care about this, but at the same time, I'm not sure I can. This is a game which is fantastic, but it's a game that's fantastic in spite of what it is. It's still this gigantic box thing that says, ooh, play me for years. And it is an endless sea of cardboard that defies organization. I mean, I've put all these things into little plastic baggies myself and I enjoy the process, but if you didn't have these things, it would be impossible. It would take forever to set up. And I mean, literally this entire setup has been in my front room permanently for about two weeks, just so I could do this review. Because honestly, I chalked up the amount of hours it would take me to keep putting it away and getting it out again, and no, 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 no. And you can massively speed up the setup time of this, of course, if you buy one of those fancy wooden inserts where everything has a place. And gosh, I'd really like one. This game would massively benefit from it, but they cost about 70 pounds. And 70 pounds basically buy you Imperial Assault. And oh, hello Imperial Assault. While you're here, we should probably mention that this game has just had an update via an app that allows you to play it as a fully co-op game. Is that any good? Well, uh, we don't know yet, but I'm going to play it over the next month. I'd recommend subscribing to the Shut Up and Sit Down podcast because we will be discussing it on that 
at the very least, in the future. You'll find some links to that in the description of this video. If this potential comparison has left you feeling a little unsure, then don't worry. We don't usually review games that aren't available in retail, but due to delays, Gloomhaven is not going to be out until January, at which point it'll be $140, which is 40% more than Star Wars in a box. What's the correct answer? We don't know yet, but as I say, keep an eye out. But still, I've got to say, having been spoiled over the years by Fancy Flight Games' production qualities, fantastic card art, clean punch board, everything is always very, very sexy and nice, Gloomhaven, by comparison, I have to say, does feel a little cheap. And some will be more bothered by this cheapness than others. Some people, for example, cannot stand the mismatch between cardboard cutouts and plastic figurines. Personally, doesn't bother me at all. I'm more put off by things like punch board that's just very poorly aligned and sometimes not coming out cleanly, a little bit of tearage, a little bit of glue stuff not being firm, which for a game you want to be getting out and playing for years and years maybe is, you know, not ideal. But the thing is, this game to me doesn't feel cheap. This game feels focused. I'd assume that Gloomhaven might just be a more affordable version of the Kingdom Death experience, but in reality, it's the complete opposite. This isn't a big flashy box that encourages you to keep digging deeper and thinking what's next and being surprised by things. No, there's nothing about this design that's flashy. It's deeply functional. The parts of this game that need to be great are great, and everything else is just as good as it needs to be, and no more, and no less. Gloomhaven demands more table space than a small Mediterranean wedding, but whilst it's a mess here, up here, it isn't. It's all quite clear. Once you get going, it's a great game that just flows. Unless, of course, it doesn't. And here, unfortunately, I feel like we might have to have a classic shut up and sit down, near end of review turnaround. Gloomhaven is perfect for me. It's crunchy, it's fun, it's hilarious when everything just goes wrong again and again, even when it's frustrating as well. But I'm a player who plays with fuzzy logic. I go with my guts. I don't fixate too much. I think that's about right, that'll do. And if you're not, if you're the kind of player who suffers from analysis paralysis too often, of just getting stuck and thinking, oh, what's the optimal move to make, then this is a game which is gonna frustrate you because it's a game, especially with three or four players, where there are a lot of unknowns. Because table talk in this game is limited to vague statements, you never really know exactly what other people are doing or when they're going to do them. And in terms of initiative, if you're coming later in the order, there's a good chance that the thing you're intending to do just won't happen. Maybe the enemy moved away, maybe it blocks your attack, maybe it's already dead. It's the sort of game where you can play your best cards, your super move, and it does nothing. And you've just got to go with it. And rolling with it can be really fun. There's a cool mechanic whereby when you put down these two cards, in your head you've already chosen, I'm going to use the bottom of this card, the top of this card, but in reality there's no reason why you can't switch them over once they're down and go, all right, what I was going to do doesn't work, but I'm going to do this alternative instead. That is very cool. But with four players, you have to accept that your plans are just frequently not going to go to plan. And that means there's a knock-on effect. Babe, you can't afford to sit there scratching your head for five minutes each turn deciding which two cards to play, because honestly, it's just gonna hurt you. Fights in this game that feature fewer heroes and fewer enemies feel more tactical and more memorable. But the biggest problem with four players, by quite a margin, there's just too much admin. You see, with two players, there's a genuine satisfaction to the mild admin that comes along with it. You kind of go, two plus one, and he's poisoned, and then you hit him again, and da, 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 da. he's dead! We killed the guy, fantastic! But with four, things change so quickly that it just, this keeping track of stuff feels pointless. It's that, and then that, and then that. How much is that? Oh, he's, he's, he's already dead, okay, fine. Mm. You kind of feel like you're constantly setting the table for dinner, um, but then realising that the guests have already eaten and left. And I didn't even talk about the element shelf! Oh my gosh, this review will physically never end! You know, I'm just not going to talk about it. It's a cool thing. When it works, when it pops, when the ideas spring to life, it's remarkably cool. But I tell you what, 90% of the time, you'll forget it's there and you'll forget to keep it updated properly because it's slightly too much admin. Mild admin is a thing that you just have to love in order to love this game. And with more players, more admin, well, it's fine because we can just split it up. I'll deal with the monster cards and the tokens and you can deal with the decks and you can deal with the element table and 
Uh, this is the point where if you've got one player at the table who just isn't into all of this sort of keeping track of stuff, then the game quite quickly starts to feel tiresome. And here's the thing, a crucial thing. This game is glacial. The more players you have at the table, the longer each mission takes, and that means you're playing less missions, and it means less variety. And this is a problem, especially in the early stages of the campaign, where you're comedically fed a series of crypts, as if at the whims of some mad social media algorithm that thinks you like crypts. You're in a crypt! Have, have four crypts! And the thing is, I can't help but find myself wondering if this game needed to be quite so big. Could it, for example, have been half as big? Or maybe could it play twice as fast? And this is a sincere, frank question that I ask about this game from the perspective of somebody who really loves it. And a bunch of the people I've played this with haven't loved it. That's important, especially in the four player sessions, I've found some people don't gel with the micromanagement, find it hard to make decisions with all of the cards they have, and frequently find that the choices they've made don't appear to matter. Also, they just find it repetitive and slow. And all of these criticisms are entirely fair. But you know what? You know what? I'm turning this near end review, turn around, back around again. I'm driving it home. I'm, I'm driving, I'm coming home. I think this game is great. It is a box infested with ideas, crammed full of components that requires more than a little management love, but I think that is fine. I think this is actively designed for people who quietly enjoy that. There's a strange pleasure to having your character in a little box and all of the cards and at the end of a session neatly packing it all away and sliding into your miniature library of stuff. Getting your little man and putting him into his neat little box. Or a lady. Or a rat. And you know what? Isn't this weird organisation fixation a part of the experience when you own and play and buy a game? This is a thing that I want to neatly pack away and put on my shelf and then get out again in a part of a ritual which involves a cold Saturday afternoon with central heating and cups of tea and biscuits and possibly chocolate. Because sometimes games are about that sense of ritual. And this for me is a ritual that makes me feel warm. So sure, there are lots of aspects of this game that are quite fuzzy. It definitely plays better with two or three than it does with four when it starts to slow down. And I'll be damned if I can ever find the exact bloody piece of cardboard I need. Where is, where are the cultists? But I do think that for a game of this scope and this scale and this ambition, there are elements of this design which are really elegant. But anyway, I've been filming for almost 24 hours now, so I, I better change into this t-shirt for continuity reasons and uh, resume my HR meeting with, with Quentin in the kitchen. Okay, well, tell you what, why don't you give me half of those P45s back and we'll just say that you're half fired. I don't think that's how it works. Uh, Get out of my office. This is my house. Is it dealt with? Yeah, actually, yeah. I think he's got a good It's me. It's dealt with. Yes, sir. Yes, I'm sorry. No, it- Very good, sir. It won't happen again. The death blow. Thank you for watching this frankly never-ending video review of Gloomhaven. If you've enjoyed it, then why not put some money in your mouth and subscribe to our YouTube channel using the buttons on the website. Why subscribe to our YouTube channel? We've got loads of videos 
and obviously every subscriber will get a free nothing pie. It's a limited time deal that just expired. I'm so sorry, you're too late. If you want to watch some other stuff, we've got some fantastic things for you over here. Paul's review of Kingdom Death is really good. Quinn's review of Twilight Imperium 4th edition is fantastic, and my review of Imperial Assault is pretty nice. Some other big games for your big game sensibilities and mind. Thank you, and good